Works. A very warm welcome to our panel, Bright Futures, Young Adults Work Life Choices in Metropolitan Japan. So my name is Nora Kotman and we will get started right away in order to have as much, as time, uh, much time as possible for a discussion. Um, but uh, let me just shortly address some organizational issues. So we will present the papers in the listed order and uh, please feel free to write any questions and or comments in the chat or just keep them in mind for the final discussion. And we were just encouraged to please use the VUVA chat and not the Zoom chat uh, since um, some people might not be able to see the, no, because the recording will not take the Zoom chat. That's uh, how I understood it. So please try to use the VUVA chat. So we will have a final joint discussion of all papers after the last presentation, but in case you have a very short, immediate or specific questions, there will also be one or two minutes to address them immediately after the respective presentation. So let's get started. The first paper will be presented by Ekaterina Hertog uh, from the University of Oxford. Please go ahead. And... Um, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and to present my paper, and I'm so happy this is happening a year later, but we are all hopefully wiser. Um, so without further ado, uh, I will start presenting my paper, and I will try to put my slides into the... Um, Okay, hopefully now it's in the proper presentation mode. Um, so today's talk is on um, gender, the associations between gender, education, and domestic work in contemporary Japan. And I look at the, I mean, not very historic, but the last roughly covering the last 30 years and the changes um, in the household. This is a, uh, in the households. This is a collaborative project that I co-authored with my colleague Man Yi Khan at the Department of Sociology, University of Oxford. So first, uh, why study, just a few minutes, why study uh, domestic work, a sort of private domestic sphere? Well, uh, time spent, our time is finite, time spent invested in housework or care work cannot be spent on anything else, including paid work or studying or rest and so on. This is just an illustration comparing um, the time spent on paid and unpaid work in UK and Japan. And I chose these two cases really for illustrative purposes, but if you uh, look at the gender inequality, recent gender inequality indexes, it covers about 153 countries. Japan is 121 uh, towards the bottom, one of the most unequal ones. And UK is number 21 actually. So it's on the more, uh, one of the more equal ones. And what does that, so how does that translate and the sharing in the labor market, the equality in the labor market and the domestic sphere. Well, in both, on the one hand, we see broad similarities. In both UK and in Japan, uh, men do more paid work and women do see the blue bars and women do more unpaid work. These are the red bars uh, in both countries. The time is measured in minutes. So if you think 300 minutes uh, on a typical day, that's about five hours on a typical day, a Japanese woman spends on various types of housework and childcare. These are only adults 20 years plus. It includes the elderly. So the similarities is women do more unpaid work, uh, but at the same time, the big difference is the, the inequality is much larger in Japan than it is in the UK. And uh, that has knock on effects for paid labor market participation, incomes, well being, and so on. So um, across the world, women do take care of most of the domestic work, but the size of the gap uh, varies a lot between countries. The gap has been shrinking in recent years. And actually, anecdotally, I hear from Japanese friends and colleagues often the following comment when I tell them I study unpaid work, domestic work, housework, care work. Academics, at least, say, well, it used to be very unequal. But these days, my husband and I, we share things fairly equally. It's actually not that bad. It's only the older generation for whom this is the case, and so on. At the same time, on the academic side, um, it's very hard to access the kind of data that I use for my research. So almost all research is done using Western data. And what we know from the West is education is the key mechanism mediating the sharing of housework and care work in households. So uh, one of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues in Oxford did a study looking at gender unequal Western societies, including Germany, Italy, Spain, for example. And she showed that in recent decades, we see a, 
a much uh, quicker shrinking of the gender gap in um, housework and care work uh, in the particularly unequal societies compared to more equal, uh, you know, Sweden, Norway that we often hear about. But is this the case in Japan? Uh, and we don't know. Uh, so I uh, so this was the motivation for this paper. There are a number of theories that try to explain or predict the relationship, how education could influence uh, domestic work participation. And first of all, education uh, could be translated into resources. So people who are better educated are more likely to get uh, better paying jobs. And as a result, either be part of a sort of breadwinner homemaker model where they outsource the unpleasant uh, housework and perhaps care work as well to their spouses, while they themselves bring the income and focus on that. Alternatively, um, it could also be used as resources could be used to outsource unpaid work to the market, hiring nannies, cleaners, eating out, um, and so on. Another um, argument goes that education Higher levels of educational attainment are associated with uh, more gender equal attitudes. And therefore, we would expect people with higher education to hold, uh, to prefer gender equality within their families. And if we think about the Japanese context, we would expect men, better educated men, to spend more time on housework and care work, and better educated women, less time on housework and care work at, compared to their less educated counterparts in, of their own gender. Um, in, uh, in Western countries, we more recently, we also uh, hear about parental investments and uh, probably all of you, at least in the media, heard words like tiger mom, helicopter parenting, and so on. And so, and this all refers to highly educated parents or parents with greater assets investing more money, but also time into their children to try to secure better educational outcomes um, and generally better outcomes uh, for these children. Uh, this is very well documented in the US, but it's more recently, again, we, we see um, evidence that in many European countries, this hasn't been studied in Japan. This refers not to all types of unpaid work, but only to child care, but child care is the most time consuming type of care work. Finally, uh, we also hear about education and doing gender. And that is, uh, this theory says that we actually, the way education will be associated to with unpaid work depends on one's gender. And uh, research should be more nuanced in that regard. And if one's level of attainment or achievement is not compatible with one's typical gender role, like think high income, highly educated women, or perhaps low income, low educated men married to better educated spouses, then they would use other means, including time spent their domestic work to uh, repair their damaged gender identity. For example, these highly educated women would invest more time also in housework to show that not only they're achieving in the labor market, perhaps, or in education, uh, but they are also good wives and good mothers. And conversely, uh, this has been shown in the UK, for example, low educated men or low status men often do less um, housework and child care than their better educated or better employed counter male counterparts, because this is sort of trying to reinforce their damaged masculine identity. So these, there are this number of theoretical perspectives. We see evidence from different societies. And basically what we gather from the research that these different theories have been shown to play a role in different contexts. Um, Japan is a particularly interesting context because on the one hand, it's society characterized by very high levels of education. So this is a graph and I realize I should have sort of color coded men and women a bit more. <laughs> I was, um, yeah, I didn't want to do pink and blue, but now I think it's a bit hard to read. I'm sorry about that, but this is educational attainments by gender, completed levels of education in Japan in post-war years. And as we can see, um, if, if we look at our period of interest, which is from early 1990s, which is sort of the second half of the graph roughly, there's barely any difference observed, gender difference observed in secondary education. In 2000s, virtually 100% of men and women complete uh, secondary education, but we still see a gap in tertiary education. More women than men uh, graduate from junior colleges in Japan, more men than women complete um, university, graduate from university, four year university courses or more. This gap continues if you look also at graduate schools. Again, uh, men, on, men attain higher levels, complete um, higher levels of education. 
But this gap has also been shrinking. It's not very high if we think of it in international comparison. At the same time, I've, I already anticipated in my introduction, uh, Japan is uh, also highly unequal on the domestic front. Uh, gender gap in domestic work participation is high, even in comparison with other East Asian countries, excluding South Korea, uh, which is very similar in that respect to Japan. Marriage dramatically increases women's housework time, but not men's. Having children uh, increases husband's share of domestic work to some extent, uh, but as I'll show in a minute, it's a very it's going up from a very very low uh, level. So this is the data. I won't go into great detail, uh, but this is the government uh, time use data collected in Japan. Uh, from they've actually the survey started from late 1970s, uh, but the way it's been collected, the early waves of the survey are not comparable with the later ones. So I took the earliest data point that we could um, do for comparative analysis, and that's been 1991. The survey is repeated every five years, so this year we should expect the next one if they manage. My sample is limited to married uh, couples with co-resident spouses aged 20 to 59. So I was interested specifically in working age uh, married men and women. So first of all, this is just uh, just an averages, just a bar chart, and just looking at that, I think there's, the, there's a couple of takeaways from these graphs. First, women do a lot more housework and more care work. Um, housework is, takes a lot longer. And that's the reason why I put the graphs on the same scale, uh, just to show how much more time consuming housework is compared to care work. Care work is mostly child care. Um, women do more of both. There's a huge gap in both. Uh, Care work is slightly more equally share, um, shared uh, compared to housework. Finally, over time, there is a growing gender equality. So if you can see, uh, oh, there's a slight incline, women do less, a bit less on average of housework with every later year, and men do a bit more. The change is very slow. It's glacial, it's barely noticeable, um, but it's there. And again, these are all averages. So they average between weekdays and weekends. Uh, okay, this is just to show you the share. Um, and I, I use the slide when people tell me things have changed in Japan and they did, they have changed indeed. In 1991, uh, wives, um, this is specifically my sample. So married women, 2059, uh, did 93% of all housework and 88% of all uh, care work. These days is 87% of all housework and 80% of all care work. So things are improving, but very, very slowly in the domestic sphere, at least for married women. I think if we look at the whole population, we might see bigger differences, but this to some extent is driven by higher marriage agents, greater incidence of um, single lifelong singlehood and, uh, and so on. When we focus on married uh, couples, things change, but slowly. And these are my uh, results. Uh, these are my core results. Uh, so these are predicted minutes. Uh, this is the outcomes of uh, linear regressions. Uh, just sort of, again, you can ask me about the methods and I'll give you the details. But uh, if you look at the lightest gray shades, these are the 1990s. And at the bottom, we see years in education. It starts from nine years in education. This is compulsory um, levels of education in Japan. It's uh, yeah, primary school and the first three years of the secondary. And uh, 16 years in education, that's university. Um, in the 1990s, for women, there's barely, oh, sorry, these are all men. In the 1990s, for housework, this basic education makes no difference. They All men do very little. This is less than 20 minutes per day. And whether they're low educated or high educated, it doesn't really matter. In early 2001, we maybe see sort of somewhat negative slope, better men with more resources do less than men with less resources. Overall, men do a little bit more uh, than they did in the 90s. Starting from mid 2000s onwards, we start observing a positive slope. That means that higher educated men start contributing more to housework compared, compared to their less educated counterparts. And overall, all men do with every year, they do a little bit more, more or less. That's broadly the trend. Sometimes the, the lines overlap, but overall, this is the trend. Um, this is what seems to be happening. 
Uh, in care, we see a very similar picture. In the 1990s, actually a negative slope, better educated men spend less time with their children mostly. And from 2000s, it's positive. It's very, very, uh, the positive incline is quite small. Overall time is very small. We're talking about 15 versus 18 minutes per day in terms of care, and probably like 38 versus maybe 45 minutes per day for housework. What about women? Uh, this is how it looks for women. In the 1990s, if you think about housework, we see a huge positive incline uh, for women. Uh, so better educated women do actually a lot more housework in the 90s compared to their less educated counterparts. This would be consistent with uh, an interpretation that highly educated women marry highly educated men who have higher incomes and are able to become professional housewives and perfect the domestic, um, domestic sphere, really focus on it. And but this slope disappears over time. And also for women, we observe in the latest years, in the sort of 2011, 2016, especially, all uh, overall uh, women, especially highly educated women, do less housework compared to the uh, uh, compared to highly educated women in earlier years. In uh, care work, um, it's the picture is different and it's quite interesting. Uh, there's barely any change in terms of time spent on care work uh, for, at the lower levels of education, but uh, with, with years, we see that higher educated women start investing more and more over time, and uh, this just goes quite uh, linearly if you think about it, and the highest uh, time spent on childcare is almost, in 2016, it's almost doubled, no, it's more than doubled. Uh, women with only compulsory levels of education uh, spend 40 minutes a day on care work on average, while women with university degrees spend uh, probably around 90 uh, minutes per day on average on care work. So that, that's consistent with parental investment. Uh, I think I'm sort of close to my, I, I should be finishing now. So this is just my summary and conclusions. The change in the division of labor, I anticipated them throughout the talk, the change in the division of labor at home ha is happening, but it's very slow. Uh, the link between education and paid work contributions changed dramatically over the past sort of 25, 30 years in Japan. Uh, so in early 1990s, what we see is most consistent with sort of breadwinners, professional housewives set up where men convert resources into a, a sort of less housework and care work. After 2000s, there's a bit more evidence for gender egalitarianism with more educated men spending a bit more time, more educated women spending a bit less time on domestic work, uh, on housework specifically. For care work after 2000s, we observed in increased parental investment by better educated parents, especially the wives. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, Ekaterina. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. And um, are there any immediate questions? In case you have them, please <laughs> raise your voice now. Otherwise, we would like to have the joint discussion at the very end of all presentations. Anything immediate? Okay, doesn't look like so. Please, in case you have any bigger questions, put them in the chat or keep them in mind for later. And then I would like to introduce the second speaker. Um, it's Ofra Goldstein-Gidoni from Tel Aviv University who will be talking about house husbands and breadwinning wives. Ah, yeah. Okay, it already looks perfect. Ofra, the floor is yours. Please go. You are muted, uh, Ofra, you're still muted. Um, after, yeah, after now it's good. Doing this for so long in teaching, I still uh, make mistakes. Anyway, so let's go. Emiko and Ajime, both born in 1986, define themselves as a, res a reversed couple, Gyakufufu or as a couple whose partnership is based on role change, Yakuari no Kotai. In a long uh, joint interview I, had, I held with them in 2018, Hajime explained that he had always been interested in childcare and house calls. In fact, as he both 
clarified during this first interview, they determined very, uh, very early in their relationship while they were still in college, that based on who is better and what, when time comes, he would be the one to take care of children at home while she will pursue work. The idea of role reversal came up very often in the interviews I held, I've held with couples in which the men, those couples are couples in which the man is self-defined as either a full-time or part-time house husband. Sengyo Shufu or Kengyo Shufu. Shufu goes for the man here. And the wife is the main breadwinner. The data, ideas, and, and indeed questions that I will present here today are the results of an ongoing extended ethnographic studies I've been uh, involved in since 2013. The larger study comprises of multi-sided fieldwork, uh, ethnographic interviews with men and women. Today, I will focus on interviews with couples, both jointly and individually, some of which were unfortunately recently conducted via, via Zoom. The background for my extended study is a growing participation of women in the workforce, coupled with the growing public interest in Japan in new definitions of men, especially fathers, a, 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 and their participations in the a, in family life. The discourse, this discourse of a, new roles for, for fathers is captured by the popular a, neologism ikumen, a, which presents fathers a, actively involved in childcare in ikuji as cool men. Other related trends uh, that are the background of, of my uh, work include uh, the work style reform, Hataraki Kata Kaikaku, introduced by the Japanese government in 2016, as well as the emerging public uh, discourse um, encompassing both the state and the corporate sector about Japan, Japan, Japanese society's work life balance. Against this shifting background, this paper will ask whether an emerging, albeit still a small minority phenomenon of astronormative families who have discarded the strongly uh, embedded gender division of men at work, women at home, may be regarded as troubling conventional understandings of masculinity, femininity, and gender. More generally, the ideas and questions that I will suggest here join my recent research agenda focusing on the question of the potentiality of change in gender relations in Japan. I pose this question within the framework of undoing gender. Uh, Katrina uh, mentioned doing gender, I'm talking about the undoing, which is, of course, related. In an article titled Undoing Gender, published in Gender and Society in 2007, Deutsch suggested that we use undoing gender to refer to social interaction, interactions that reduce gender differences. In 2009, Griezmann added, Another criterion for identifying undoing gender, suggesting that it might be when the essentialism of binary distinctions between people based on sex category is challenged. Doing an undoing gender emerged from a constructionist perspective that regards the interactional level as a site of change. However, Focusing on the, inter on the interactional level does not imply forsaking the structural level. In fact, in order to understand change, we need to theorize and research the relations between the structural and the interactional levels. I've begun to tackle this question of the potentiality of change in gender relations in contemporary Japan in my previous work. First, I focused on the agenda activities and members of Japan's uh, leading new fathers movement, Father in Japan, and on the emerging, on an emerging group of working fathers, namely fathers who explicitly organize their working lives around the family responsibility they are committed or obliged to assume. Then, so this was one work, then in a more recent article, forthcoming article, Focus, I focused on a group of men who reject actually the so-called carefree ecumen image and who explicitly and proactively shutaiteki define themselves as house husband. I pursued the same, in this article, I pursued the same perspective that does not hesitate to con in considering the pot potentiality of change in gender relations. The article explores the interactive and creative process through which this marginal group of men craft 
their new identities as self-reliant, responsible caretakers of children and the home. In both previous papers, the notion of undoing gender did not claim for the unraveling of gender relation. It's, instead, I adopt the idea of slow dripping change as suggested by Oriel Sullivan, which allows us to see change in gender relations and gender ideologies, even if it's still in its very basic uh, uh, stage and even it's, if it's very slow as uh, Katrina showed before. After focusing on changing men, my current uh, interest is in couples and the ways in which both men and women experience and present their reversed pattern of partnership as related to work and the home. Adhering to a thorough ethnographic inquiry that focuses on the lived experiences and the interactional level, while not neglect neglecting the uh, organizational level, I can see also the obstacles and the endurances that uh, uh, men and especially women, I uh, focus here, uh, while uh, women, while men breadwinners and the obstacles that they uh, tackle. Haruko, who is 47, defines her partnership with Shuichi as Fufu, Fufu Gyakten no Style, a reversed style couple. Alter, who studied in 2007 in an article, Holter, who studied men's family and work reconciliation in Europe, theorized two models of change from breadwinning masculinities to caring masculinities. Whereas Hajime, Hajime that I, I mentioned earlier, who had always been interested in a child care and house course, as he said, seemed to perfectly align with a new model, new men model, uh, which is mainly ideological. Shuichi seems to represent the more practical new circumstance, a uh, new circumstance model that, of change that they uh, also suggest. At the age of 30, newly married Shuichi got ill with the auto, uh, autoimmune disease. After a few months of sick leave, he decided to leave his demanded full-time job. At the time, leaving his employment was for him equal to resigning from marriage given that he would no longer uh, 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 be able to provide for his wife. However, as you recall, in our first of many interviews, uh, his wife reacted aggressively to his proposal that they would get divorced uh, and, with, and resolutely told him that she would maintain uh, uh, him while he could stay home without uh, feeling guilty. So he said, so I succumbed and became a chufu, a house husband, even though I didn't want to. Shuichi, Shuichi described his wife as a, a workaholic, a career-oriented person. She got an Ingen. I call her Shoah no Otosa, Shoah era father. Coming back from work, she only says, meshi, furu, neru, meal, ba, sleep. Linking her to typical Shoah era corporate warrior, totally dedicated to work and company. The world change is, seems to be very clear with the, in this case of Aruko and Shuichi. In fact, Shuichi has become one of the particularly a, a, a famous a, a house husbands in Japan. A, one of the reasons the media, the media a, find interest in, in Shuichi is related to his a, appearance and more particularly to his bleach blonde a, kimpatsu hairstyle. Shuichi clarifies that his kimpatsu hairstyle is an essential aspect of his public declaration of being a house husband. As he explained, for the first two years or so after his wife's firm resolution that he should stay at home while she became the breadwinner, he was he felt discriminated, he felt bad because, because he wanted to go to work and, and couldn't. And also he, he was being labeled as a good for nothing parasite or kimo a man who is uh, financially dependent on a woman. However, after, like I say that, uh, as the quote says, after he, he, he lived like this for a while, he came to a resolution that because she earns enough or even more than he could earn, and because, uh, 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 so he decided that the better thing would be to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, support his wife in her work and then, and this is completely, this is related to his declaration, to his wife, to his first Sengen, first declaration, 
I'm going to dye my hair blonde. Shuichi dyed her house husband declaration made him feel lighter because it removes the expectation that he could or should go back to work because a salary man cannot be blonde. However, even as she shaped his identity, his new identity as a house husband, uh, and had even one or two house husband friends, he felt Sabbath. He felt discriminated basically because he didn't have children. He, didn't, he was a, a, a childless house husband. As he felt, as, as his uh, uh, health improved, he, he pleaded his wife uh, uh, that, that she, they have a, a child, but no matter how he pleaded, she said that she strongly added to the idea that it was just impossible. But he couldn't give up. And thus came Shuichi's second sengen, second declaration to his wife. After thoroughly studying everything related to childbirth and childcare, one evening, as he still vividly recalled, he waited for her coming back from work. And as he emotionally elaborated, I declared to her that I might not be able to get pregnant, give birth or breastfeed, but otherwise I'll do, I can do everything. Uh, Shuichi and Haroko reversed couple endeavor, though not short of hindrances that I didn't have uh, time to get into, might be regarded as a so-called successful case. As I, made, as I mentioned above, after focusing on, on, on house husband, working father and house husband, I, I tried to focus more on working, on working mothers or more particularly on breadwinners, uh, 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 bread, breadwinner uh, mothers. Like with other research participants, I, I interviewed Hajime and Emiko, whom I, I mentioned in the, in the beginning, both jointly and separately. Now, in 2018, in a joint interview, Emiko and Hajime seemed quite content uh, 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 with their reverse couple uh, pattern. Emiko uh, pointed in particular to the position of women as they take the role of men Male, main breadwinners. She said, I think that in the end, it is all about feeling or state of mind, kimochi. Talking about the possibility of role change, Japanese women tend to say that they are not able to do so. But I think that if they would only try, they can make it. However, when I met Emiko for a long index Zoom interview just earlier this month, she sounded very differently. In fact, evoking the same stories of reproach with regard to her absent motherhood that she had encountered from other mothers in the playground or from public health nurses, which were told by the couple in the previous interview in a humoristic tone, suggesting that these old fashioned criticizer just could not accept the role reversal. Now, these same stories brought tears to her eyes. After several years of being strongly reproached, now also by teachers, she cannot bear the feeling of guilt and she talks about her decision to be more of a mother. Moreover, she includes in a resolution her understanding that her husband could not possibly raise a child on his own, own being a system engineer, which is typically masculine. What does it mean to be a breadwinning mother, asked Chess. Chesley in a 2007 article, 2017 article focusing about focusing on gender atypical breadwinner carer families in the US. Among other things, Chesley relates to mommy guilt. It seems that in the Japanese case, which I am in the ongoing process of exploring, the part played by Sekin, the public eye, or especially public institutions such as healthcare, schools, and so forth, is very strong and very stressful. So, and I'm coming to the conclusion. Can the emerging small, uh, 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 emerging small minority group of reverse uh, uh, role couples be regarded as pioneer of change in gender relations in Japan? Was any question about the plausibility of potential change at the center of qualitative inquiry was not in the, with the intention of assessing the level of such change. While I recognize the revolution, what Deutsch called the revolutionary uh, potential of uh, human agency, at the same time, I certainly do not seek or discard to, uh, seek to discard the critical perspective, nor to ignore the persistence of gender inequality in Japan. Like Deutsch, I do not have the answers, but I do believe in posing new questions relating to change by 
all the while maintaining also a critical perspective. Thank you. Ofra, thank you very much also for this excellent timekeeping and the fantastic okay. talk. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, good. <laughs> I made it. it was fantastic. <laughs> so um, are there any immediate questions? Uh, some uh, very yeah, I, I, I would like to pose a question to Ofra. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, how, how, how much percent would you say are there now breadwinning wife uh, couples in Japan? Uh, this, this is a tough question. I, I, I cannot say. I mean, first, I, I'm, as I say, I'm not sure that I will give the percentage even in the full paper when it was published because I'm an anthropologist, but, <laughs> but uh, it's, not, it's not a big group. But as uh, there, are, there is an interest, there are, for example, there are books about it, like a very famous uh, public, like Kojima uh, wrote uh, Daika Kobashida, Mother, uh, a book. And so there is an interest. In, but it's surely mm -hmm. it's not, but there is a growing. It's growing. It's, it's increasing. It's growing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Growing. Slowly, slowly, but growing. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Okay. So if there, please, yeah, no other immediate questions. So please keep your, if you have any questions, keep them in mind, or please use the chat function. So far, we didn't receive any questions for the final discussion. Then I would like to hand over to Annette, Annette Schatzefer from the University of Düsseldorf, who will be talking about young Japanese singers searching for managing both work and family as an idea. Annette, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your uh, kind uh, introduction, Nora. Good, good, um, good morning. Okay, expanded female labor force participation has an effect on female life course decisions and attitudes towards work and family. In Japan, women who expect to continue working are postponing marriage and tend to live as single persons. Married family women who interrupt their professional careers to give birth and raise children have difficulties to return to their former workplaces and are often forced into lower paid part-time or temporary jobs. As a result, the labor market shows a disparity among women who marry and quit their job at childbirth or who stay single, childless and work without interruption. This trend is also revealed in the M-shaped female labor force participation rate, which shows that many women quit working during their so-called reproductive years. And this is also in uh, in international perspective, the uh, black dotted line is Japan and in uh, other most other developed countries, there is no longer uh, an M-shaped uh, labor force participation rate. In Japan's economic high growth period, the social mechanism of the family was based on the gender division of labor at home and gender segregated forms of employment. The typical female life course supposed women to become a housewife married to a male breadwinner. After years of social change and due to the period of economic stagnation, the male breadwinner model is now slowly losing significance as a social norm and a rise in the employment continuation rate among married women is reported by statistical data. However, the tendency to continued employment is still rather due to an increase in the proportion of women living, living as single and working. Japanese governments have become concerned about the social phenomenon of young women staying away from marriage and remaining single without children for lifetimes, since this behavior is understood as the main cause for Japan's problem of low fertility and a hyper-aging society. Attitudes and changes of behavior of single women in Japan have become under scrutiny in sociological, empirical, and family policy studies. And I and my colleague Nora are um, also involved in this. Reasons for female postponement of marriage were identified in the wish to follow a continuous job career. Another factor is seen in corporate labor markets, such as firm-specific in-house recruiting and working styles, such as mandatory overwork and job transfers, which profoundly obstruct the reconciliation of work and family life. Japan's Liberal Democratic Party governments have established gender equality laws and work-life balance policies already since the 1990s. Since 2013, Prime Minister Abe was trying to further improve the working environment for women, and that is also called the so-called womenomics politics or shining women Japan politics, and I have been publishing on that in the past. 
policies and laws for the promotion, I, I quote, promotion of active utilization of women, unquote, Jose Katsuyaku Sushin have become established. In English, it's called the Women's Empowerment Act in 2016. And in 2018, a new legislation on work style reforms, Hataraki Katakai Kaku, was passed, including the introduction of legal, legal upper limits on overtime hours, I quote, to make it possible to realistically balance between work and child raising or nursing care responsibilities, unquote. The policies aim at the increase of women in managerial positions, the support of women in their career development, and the provision for working mothers to better reconcile work and family. And it's said that to eliminate employment barriers for women is in order to realize the, I quote, double income to kids lifestyle, unquote. Policymakers in Japan, that is my evaluation here, also seem to have eventually admitted the negative association between Japan's corporate culture and women's career empowerment. In fact, macro statistical data are reporting a recent increase in the proportion of full time employed Japanese women living in a family with children. And there is also now a discourse going on in Japanese family sociology. Uh, as Japan as a society with an increase of dual income households. In Japanese, it's called the Koyo Tomo Bataraki Shakai. And we do have uh, now um, a sharp increase in dual income households, 65%, uh, among households in which husbands are employed as salaried workers. And as you, when you compare that with the 1980s, there's still were high. Uh, 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 high proportions of households with a non-employed housewife, and it's going down. Macro statistical data provided by Japan's National Fertility Surveys conducted every five years by the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research indeed shows that until two decades ago, approximately 70% of married women still were unemployed or left employment when they gave birth, returning to the labor market as part-timers after several years due to childcare obligations. The cessation of employment pattern is being referred to as return to work, I quote, and the female employment in this family model only supplements the family income, which is still mainly provided by the husband's earnings. Although the part-time working wives are in fact living in dual income households, this arrangement can hardly be described as the kind of dual earner model that is being targeted as a political goal by the Japanese government. However, Japanese sociology of work research has pointed out that the percentage of women who actually continued working while having a baby or by taking only short leaves exceeded 50% during the more recent period between 2010 and 2014, reaching a 10% increase in only five years. If taking a look at female regular employees, the rate of women who did not interrupt their employment for giving birth and childcare has increased even more significantly, namely from only about 40% in the 1980s to 70% until 2014. This life course is called Managing Both Work and Family and has the potential of overtaking the return to work life course in the near future. So, and when, what, what you can see here, the work history of wives before and after giving birth to their first child, uh, you can see here that more than 50% now uh, of uh, married women are in continued employment when they give birth to their child. Um, okay. Um, I'm uh, focusing now on the 15th Japanese National Fertility Survey that covers attitudes toward marriage and family among Japanese singles, that is the never married population of the 18 to 34 year olds, and the proportion of never married women who choose managing both work and family as an ideal life course is actually increasing according to this survey. Similarly, the women's life course that most never married men expect from the potential partner is the working wife. 
And the, uh, uh, the typology that is being offered in the survey to the respondents is the so-called desirable life course, the so tekinat aifu kosu in Japanese, and there are five options here, full-time housewife, return to work, managing both work and family, double income, no kids, and single and working. And when we take a look at uh, the surveys, they differentiate between ideal and intended life courses of never married women. Why is, why is that the case? The question that was posed to respondents were, to the never married women were, what type of life is your ideal life? And secondly, what type of life do you think you are actually likely to lead? So that means uh, there, different, the differentiation between ideal life course and on the left hand side and the, the life course that can be realistically expected, the so called intended life course, there still are gaps. And for social policy, it's very important to identify why there still are gaps or uh, in which ways policies can intervene to reduce these gaps. And as you can see here uh, on the left bar graph, uh, the, 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 the black bar is the most recent uh, fertility survey of 2015, that uh, the return to work lifestyle still seems to be the most prioritized one, but managing both work and family is on the rise. And especially when you take a look uh, at the 1990s, there's quite steep rises there, but still incrementally going up. Uh, whereas double income, no kids or single and working doesn't seem to be an option for an ideal life course. Whereas when you take a look at the right bar, bar graph here, still return to work seems to be the most uh, prioritized option, but managing both work is going up. And also what is obvious here is that uh, when it comes to reality for most, for many women, the third most likely option still seems to be to remain single and working. And it, when, when it comes to men and their life course expectations from their future partner or wife, uh, also return to work seems to be the most likely option. Perhaps it's also the majority option now in Germany, still in, in Japan still. But when it comes to managing both work and family, it's, there are also steep rises uh, among men's expectations, so they obviously expect their wives to uh, be continuously employed. And interestingly, also is that the full time option is not does not seem to be an option anymore for men. So this also has to be has has been interpreted as a turning away from traditional gender norms. Um, when it comes to Japan as a society with an increase in dual owner couples at present, the majority of Japan's dual owner households still consist of a male breadwinner and a part-time working wife. In this couple formation, the wives have returned to work after a child raising period and are supplementing the household income. However, the return to work life course has to be clearly differentiated from the managing both work and family option. The main reason is that female part-time or tempor temporary workers are not complying with the type of labor force that is being promoted under the above described uh, national policies of active utilization of women. The reported increase of female employment continuation is mainly taking place among regular employees or limited regular employees. Uh, and we can see here that still Part-time employment among women is very high compared to men, but slightly going up is um, uh, regular employment again since 2015, perhaps. So there is hope, but still uh, room for improvement. When I, I'm uh, in the in the final part of my talk, I would like to very briefly mention what is meant by these new types of regular employment here. It's so-called limited regular employment in Japan, Japanese, gente seki kuyo, and the limitations are referring to work area, work location, and working hours. So uh, employees have the benefit, who are limited regular employees have the benefit to be um, working with less work assignments, do not have to, uh, accept transfers and do not have to uh, accept overtime work. 
Limited regular employment is actually for whom with limitations is regarded as suitable for female employees with small children. The pros are seen in a better work-life balance and that there is no irregular status. The cons are seen in a gender pay gap and no career op opportunities because most uh, corporations still expect from their regular employees that they ex 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 accept to be transferred. Uh, standard regular employment without limitation is actually still incompatible with family care responsibility. And Yamaguchi has called this uh, membership type employment, which is not a type of employment that is uh, bound to actually working contracts or employment contracts, but that uh, you have to be committed as a member of the corporation. Uh, so I come, no, uh, I, I'm sorry, I come to my conclusion. Policy reforms are promoting the continuous employment of mothers and thus the increase in dual earner households. Attitudinal changes among younger and never married cohorts show a turning away from traditional gender norms. Expectations for the life course managing both work and family show a growing need for a diversity of working styles and better work-life balance policies. And companies do offer new types of employment for employees with care obligations, but gender segregation is still strong with regard to work family choices. And I think that Japanese society is rather evolving into a modified male breadwinner model than into a dual worker, dual carer model. This is my bibliography here. So it's recorded so you can take a closer look at this later on. And I want to thank you for your attention. Annette, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. Are there any immediate questions? Otherwise, I would really like to encourage you to write your questions in the chat um, or keep them in mind for the later discussion. Okay. Annette, should I go now? <laughs> yeah, shall I introduce you? So, so maybe uh, <laughs> so the last talk um, is uh, uh, Nora Kottmann and uh, she's... Uh... Okay, okay, there's something wrong, I'm sorry. Here we go. She's a research associate at the German Institute for Japanese Studies in Tokyo. Uh, we have been colleagues before, she, she was my uh, a PhD student, and she did her um, uh, philosophical dissertation at uh, Düsseldorf University, and she's also been doing research on uh, singlehood in Japan and young adults and their attitudes towards marriage and singlehood. So go ahead. Your talk is about renegotiating what's normal work-life choices and practice practices of intimacy of never married adults in Japan. So the floor is yours, Nora. Okay, thanks a lot for this super long introduction. And um, of course, I'm very happy uh, to be part of this panel. So unfortunately in the program, a few words of my original subtitle are missing. It should have been as I wrote on the slides, work-life choices and practices of intimacy. I added this here on the slide and in in fact, I will mainly focus on broader work-life choices, including marriage decisions, but unfortunately not on quotidian practices of intimacy. So overall, I will argue that these work-life choices and the way they are recounted in narrations can be understood as renegotiations of what's normal. And of course, I'm putting normal in quotation marks. So today's paper is part of actually two um, bigger research projects, one on marriage decisions and the other one on intimate spaces. So my empirical focus today is on unmarried adults, so-called singles between the ages of 25 and 49 in metropolitan Japan. I will outline the socioeconomic context of the topic and introduce some basic theoretical assumptions. I will then give an overview of all my data and introduce some pre-pandemic findings. Finally, I will touch upon the ongoing pandemic and its possible impacts on singles work-life choices. 
so in post-rich Japan, gender-specific so-called institutionalized or standard, standardized life courses have been emerging and marriage at a certain age has been an integral central part of these life courses as we have already heard today. This has been true for both women and men, although the decision to get married affected and still affects, as we also heard, their lives differently. In the last decades, particularly since the late 1990s, however, marriage behavior has been changing significantly, as has already been uh, discussed as well. So in 2015, just above 23% of men and 14% of women were so-called lifelong singles, which is never married individuals at the age of 50. These numbers indicate a huge jump since the 1990s and further increase is expected as you can see on the slide. Interestingly enough, however, marriage continues to be an aspirational goal for many. Almost 90% of young adults state that they want to get married one day. This means that against the backdrop of a changing socioeconomic context, increasing precarious employment or changing gender roles, large parts of the young generation may not be able to get married or may end up unmarried for various, most probably multidimensional reasons. So utilizing Lauren Berlant's concept of cruel optimism, we can therefore state that, I quote, that moral intimate economic thing called the good life, which has obviously always been a utopia to a certain degree, has become more phantasmatic with less and less relation to how people actually live. So against this backdrop, I'm interested in how young and middle-aged adults navigate and narrate their work-life choices, including their decision to get married or to not get married. So let me shortly elaborate on my data. In my paper, I draw on extensive fieldwork, mostly interviews and participant observations in 2010, 11, 15, and from 2018 onwards. I focused on un or never married adults, but purposefully included a few uh, interviews with engaged or married people. I will also introduce quantitative data from an original large scale survey, which I have been conducting with my wonderful colleague Laura Days from the University of Western Australia in uh, early this year in January 2021, when field work became more and more difficult. Um, but first of all, let's have a look at the pre-pandemic data. So when I conducted first biographical interviews in 2010, I usually started with a very general initial question aiming at generating a narration. I asked something like, please tell me about your life. How has it been so far? What have you been doing? I remember being astonished at how many of my interviewees reacted to this question. Akira, for example, unmarried, unpartnered, and working at a prestigious university aiming for a professorship stayed, started as follows. I live a strange life. He later specified and somehow flirting with his supposed strangeness, I live differently than normal people do. And Hikari, a financially well-off woman in her late 20s in an on-off relationship with her boyfriend, uh, her then boyfriend, explicitly warned me, my life is not normal. Is that okay? In contrary, Kaori, a newlywed woman in full-time employment, stopped after short self-introduction, hesitating, are you disappointed? How has my life been so far? Normal, orthodox. So while these statements or disclosures were very vague in general, I encountered similar and far more specific narrations throughout the interviews and during participant observations. Further, interviewees not only labeled their lives as normal or unnormal, but also specific work-life choices. So Mari, um, who has been living with her parents at the time of the interview elaborated, According to my plan, I imagined getting married at a normal age. Normally, okay, it's somehow weird to say normal, but I imagined getting married and having kids and unbelievable. Now I'm 29 and still alone. Sometimes I really wonder how my life is going to be. And this resembles Hiroki's wish to, I quote, build up a normal life in Japan um, after his return to, the, to Japan from the US where he had been living for a couple of years. Others, like Momo, a young woman who lived together with her partner, as she would call him, stated, I could never live a normal life as a housewife. These and numerous other references to normal lives or perceived gendered normalcy through affirmation or rejection indicate a strong orientation of my interviewees towards the gendered standardized life courses of post war Japan. Marriage and full-time employment in the case of men seem to be an unmistakable point of orientation, despite ambivalences and ambiguities. 
So these findings resonate well with previous research, particularly on work-life choices of unmarried women. Um, borrowing the words of the interviewees and research participants, we have, for example, Hiromi Tanakanaji, who speaks of normal deviance of biographical choices, Lynn Nakano, of, uh, who speaks of unconventional life choices, and Laura Dales and Beverly Yamamoto, who speak of unconventional women. Following up on these findings, I would, however, like to add three additional facets to this narrative. First, male perspectives, as already shown above, a second, overlapping or shifting self labels, and third, a conscious formulation of what I would call alternative normalities. So, interestingly, the self labels or references to a kind of normalcy are not as simple or clear as they might appear. Rather, they are partly ambivalent, overlapping, or supposedly contradicting. This becomes especially clear when looking at the narrations of married individuals. Kaori, for example, whom I already cited before, pondered during the interview, well, sometimes I'm wondering if I should have waited. I also kind of regret getting married at 30. It's not normal. None of my girlfriends is married. Um, and uh, in particular, men married, engaged a singer, characterize themselves as not normal anymore through labels like conservative, traditional, or old fashioned when referring to their desire to get normally married at a certain age, to be the breadwinner and to work long hours as salarymen. Sometimes they were even slightly embarrassed or told me that somehow apologetically. So these and similar narrations refer to social change and show individuals need and wish to adjust to changing realities. Therefore, they can be interpreted as subtle negotiations of what's normal, as we have already heard before as well. So finally, other research participants went much further, articulating the conscious search for alternative normalities. Maya and Ken, for example, both singles and the sense of unmarried, lived together with approximately 65 people between the ages of three weeks and 60 years in a housing project on the 13th floor of a new architect design building in an exclusive and hip part of central Tokyo. Both were, just as many of their cohabitants, successful freelancers in media and design. They elaborated, we consider everybody here as part of our family. We are one extended family. We show new ways of living. And actually, they do so very successfully. The housing project and the idea of an extended family is celebrated by the media, and the project is supported by the government and various private investors. And here on the slide, you can see Ken, um, who is um, featured in a magazine where he elaborates on his idea of family. So Hannah, in contrary, a single woman who had been living alone for many years, described in her efforts to get to know older single women in the neighborhood to learn how to age alone. She said, I feel comfortable living and aging alone is normal nowadays. So what we see here, I argue, is the emergence of diverse new ways of living and relating. So finally, let me touch upon the preliminary effects of the pandemic on singles work life choices. In Japan, as I'm sure most or all of you know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic arrived early in February 2020. By April 3, national borders were closed. The first state of emergency was implemented in April, and concurrently, the fourth state of emergency is ongoing, probably until mid-September, probably longer. So while restaurants, department stores, and schools were temporarily closed, uh, now they are again closed, but of, uh, the schools, um, after summer 2020, hardly any restrictions were noticeable in everyday life. Residents, however, were encouraged and are encouraged to stay at home and most importantly, to practice self-restraint and social distancing. This includes the call to avoid the so-called free seas, closed spaces, crowds, and closed contact situations. So in this context, and amidst increasing difficulties to conduct classic fieldwork, Laura, who unfortunately cannot be here today, and I conducted our original large-scale survey, in order to investigate effects of the pandemic on singles, their relationship worlds and practices. You can find some details on the slide, but I will not go into detail here, but only refer to a couple of findings. So in a set of questions, we address the possible impact of the pandemic on perceptions, practices, and one's well-being. Using a Likert scale, we ask participants to indicate their opinions on 13 statements. Three of them focused on perceptions of singles and activities conducted alone. And here in the site, 
So doing things alone in Japanese sorokatsu has gained significant attention in public and media discourse a few years before the start of the pandemic. Numerous lifestyle magazines and blogs praise such solo activities as precious me time or introduce a huge variety of specific activities. But let's get back to the survey. So as you can see on the slide, findings with regard to the first um, statement are rather ambivalent. It's very descriptive data here, so um, just a general overview. Um, a small majority of men and women disagreed with the first statement. Slightly more men than women agreed. However, if we look at the data in a little bit more detail, we can see that the majority of younger age groups, men in the two youngest age groups and women in the second youngest age group, do think that the image of singles has improved. Regarding the second statement, uh, with 60% and 54.9%, a clear majority of women and men agree to it. However, the number of women and again younger age groups is significantly higher. Further analysis is needed to fully understand the data, but at this stage of an analysis, we hypothesize. So there is a perceived impact of the pandemic on perceptions of singles and doing things alone, which however is not huge and younger age groups, and in particular women, evaluate this impact more positively than men and the elder. Particularly with regard to the significantly improved perceptions of doing things alone, we anticipate the pandemic might have been the reason to actually do things alone. And in, this, in the context of a pandemic, when all are encouraged to act alone and being together is considered inappropriate or even dangerous, that what was once stigmatized is reconsidered as appealing, as responsible, or possibly normal. And another note uh, aside here is uh, the commodification of solo activities, like solo camping, which you can see on the, uh, on the slide, um, since the start of the pandemic is surprising. So solo camping was actually chosen as one of the top 10 national buzzwords of 2020. And uh, restaurants are also starting to increasingly cater to the needs of solo customers. So to sum up, while we still not fully understand the short, middle or long-term effects, we might conclude that being single and doing things alone in public is encouraged and partially normalized in times of the pandemic. So let me get to my conclusion. Um, I argued that the work-life choices of my interviewees, or to be more precise, the narrations of them, can be described as renegotiations of what's normal against the backdrop of changing socioeconomic circumstances and in the light of a conscious search for alternative ways of living. That what has long been considered a normal or a good life is therefore not only becoming more and more phantasmatic, as I cited Berlin in the beginning, but also at least partially less desirable although this kind of life continues to be legally and politically protected. So the pandemic and policies on curbing the spread of the virus have certainly intensified these changes. I would say that the, they have served as a uh, catalyst. So individual renegotiations of what's normal are now also to be situated in the context of an overall societal search for or the constitution of that what is considered to be the new normal. So while severe negative gender defects of the pandemic may not be overlooked, for example, a rise in suicide, societal isolation, or economic uncertainties, particularly for women, we might also see a partial destigmatization of being single, um, again, particularly for women and younger age groups. This may also, I conclude, uh, conclude, include the possibility for a shared sense of commonality among the increasing number of unmarried individuals in contemporary Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nora, for a wonderful and for keeping for wonderful talk and for keeping uh, your time very strictly, everyone. So um, would you take over as our chair to uh, moderate the discussion or how shall we do that? Um, I can do that. What get, um, yeah, the the, uh, Ekaterina is waving her hand already. I'm not volunteering the chair, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I have a question to Nora. Is that okay or is it a bit too fast? Okay. Oh, no, no, oh. it's fine, I think. Okay. Uh, great. I was just trying to open the chat, but now I'm set. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, thanks a lot. I mean, it was really a pleasure. It's such a well organized uh, panel, I think, and the talks are so well connected. So, a, a pleasure. And going to my question, I, I really enjoyed your talk, Nora, and um, I found quite interesting, especially the, the late, the last findings, your discussion about the effect of COVID pandemic and in the sort of discourse and acceptance of the loneliness. And uh, although you touched upon it a little bit saying we shouldn't obviously rise of suicides and mental health issues, but I wanted to probe a little bit more. So in, in, in the UK, for example, uh, we had a particular treatment of singles with the lockdowns because it's, it was re um, recognized um, the issue of loneliness after a couple of months. I mean, of course, in the UK context, those of you who are familiar with it, the first lockdowns were very strict with uh, not maybe the strictest in the world, but pretty much we were supposed to stay home, everything was closed, and we were allowed to walk once a day or something like that, and, and only locally um, in the nearby parks. Um, at a later stage, uh, they were recognized recognizing that some people who live alone really suffered from loneliness. And while we were not allowed, uh, so I, I live with a family, if you had a household, you generally were not supposed to meet other households in the strict times. Singles were allowed to bubble up. So if you were single, you could say, I'm alone. I am, you were allowed to bubble up with one more person. And uh, if you were walking with another adult, for example, I occasionally would walk in the park with a female friend when I was going completely nuts. We were always agreeing that we'll just say we're single <laughs> and therefore we are allowed. So there were special dispensations, that's my point, and recognition that you know being single in the lockdown is very hard. And if anything, I don't think we had very many positive images so far uh, that much. It was sort of originally suffering of parents with small children, but later on, suffering of singles, I haven't touched anyone for months and so on. Uh, so I'm quite surprised that in Japan, it seems almost the opposite. Um, so sorry, it's not quite a question, but I, yeah, what do you a think? wonderful comment. I really <laughs> like that. And that's actually something that struck us very much in the beginning as well, because um, I or we do think that the singles are a void in public discourse in terms of loneliness, but when the suicide rates um, uh, increased, um, I, um, there was just as in England, actually, a minister of loneliness was um, um, appointed, um, who didn't uh, help too much so far. But uh, what I want you to say is two things. So first, we don't had a re we didn't we never had a real lockdown. So there, the situation was a little bit uh, different. People were allowed to go out. They were encouraged to stay at home, but they were not forced to stay at home. And um, then there's the, we have to differentiate between singles who are actually solo dwellers and then singles who live with others. We have a high rate of um, singles in Japan who live with their parents. Um, but there was almost no discussion about solo dwellers which was really surprising for me. But then we had the discussion, we, there was, or I would say there is a big discourse on people doing things alone in public, and this is very positive. Oh, so thank I you. don't know if it's answered anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really interesting. It's just really interesting. I think there's more research. I mean, your topic is fascinating. So more, more um, to follow. It's very interesting how singles are treated and loneliness, I mean, this uh, is treated in different societies, especially in the extreme cases like lockdowns, after extreme sort of experiences like lockdown and so on. Yeah. Okay. I, I very much love the Belgian way. Ah, sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm I'm sorry. There are hands from, from the uh, floor now. And there is from Isa Kavetsija. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting panel. Thank you very much. Um, so with my anthropology sociology section convener, I would sort of like to push you a little bit on the on the futurity theme. And I see this this panel really as answering the question on on imagined future, what kind of futures are imagined in Japan and what kind of futures are 
possible to imagine. But I guess I was also kind of interested in this aspect that seems to underlie several of the presentation of sort of who can hope to have a future and of what kind, who can ha hope for say normalcy as, as Nora mentioned um, and what normalcy might mean, who can hope for riso uh, tekina um, and sort of the disjunction of, of anticipation and hope with these ideas of normalcy and and riso ideal. So I would, if if you could comment a little bit on that, I'd really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I can say something. I mean, it, it was general, I guess. No, or or was it for Nora? I think. Please go ahead, Ofra. I, I just wanted to I think say it was that, for all. That, uh, although Nora. Uh, your talk was your great talk was about normal what is normal and I, like and like I wrote a paper about being were married as normal and you know and now it, 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 I, I think it, your idea is very interesting uh, uh, but but I think I don't know if you are you are hinting for that but in a way we we I take my my responsibility but I say we in a way uh, keep on the line of, of looking mainly on, on, on middle class, educated people like educated you're like Katrina talked about educated the change so in a way uh, 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 the future is better still <laughs> or people from the middle class can can hope for a better future maybe and, and they can they they are the ones who also can think about alternative normalities normalities whatever and, and maybe maybe it's not exactly about those who are on the margin, marginal group. I mean, I talked about the marginal group, but it's not a marginal group in, in, in the uh, uh, from the point of view of, of class or 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 uh, economically. So I think this your your point can be interesting to to explore more from the point of view of, of who are we looking at as anthropologists or in sociology. Could, could I add a few words? Do we still have time? Yes. To, Isa's com uh, to respond to Isa's comment, so, okay? So, the, I mean, my talk obviously looked at the past data, so not so much at the futures. However, I, I work on a big project now, which looks at the future of unpaid work in Japan, as some of you might have heard. Um, uh, among other things, we looked at this future imaginaries and um, domestic roles. So we've carried out, we've completed a survey of Japanese experts. Um, these were specifically technology designers, domestic technology designers, like iRobot Roomba is what we know well these days, but future cooks, laundry machines, and so on. It's very interesting to see at the gender differences. So um, Japanese women are more positive about, uh, you know, the need and uh, the demand and the ability sort of uh, to have those technologies. As well, for, from men, we get comments like, who is going to buy it? Or, sort of, you know, it's going to be too expensive. Wife's doing it. And, and we had one that was really extreme. Only one person said that um, if, if we have all these robots to do domestic work, the wife's not going to move. It's going to be unhealthy or something of the kind. So it's quite interesting about who is imagining the future. And in this project of looking at future imaginaries, as I said, we, we looked at this technology experts, high, very highly educated, specific specifically working in like robotics or automation fields. And, but we also look at government discourses. They recently had a, a really nice video imagining Japan in 2050 or something like that, when they're all this fancy technology, remote distance work and so on. And while they portray Korea women there, so there's this families and both men and women are able to work because all this flexibility, the woman drags around the child all the time while the dad's calling calls in on Skype and achieves his ecumen, so um, capabilities. Uh, so I think it's very interesting questions about the imaginaries, who is imagining and who is able to sort of support. So there's individuals, but also which kind of backup they get institutionally and policy-wise and so on. Yeah, may I conclude also? Thank you very much. Uh, I also, as a convener, I also want to add that I think all the, all the four presentations match very well together. Um, well, I, as you uh, have noticed that I was more focusing on the social policy side 
And the government, the Japanese government is actually uh, following an ideal that is very close to the Western welfare state ideal that is the dual earner, dual carer model. So, but that implies that men also have the possibility to be a carer, which is not the case at the moment, which came quite clear from Ekaterina's talk. And um, so uh, the reality still is that we do have maybe a dual earner model now, but still uh, that women are doing most of the bulk of housework, household work, and that um, maybe they get help from their parents or from third parties. But um, I also found it interesting that uh, with regard to Ofra's talk, that more and more couples are now turning around to that they decide that the wo wo woman should be the breadwinner and the husband, the house husband. But I'm really wondering, is that a change in um, structures or gender norms? I mean, there is obviously, but uh, why is that so difficult to realize the ideal of dual earner, dual carer. And I think that most of the realistic option for most women still is to become single and working woman. And uh, this is from the point of view of the government or the public very negatively concerned. But as Nora's talk was making obvious there, on the individual level, there, there is a change to uh, more normalcy with regards to staying single. <laughs> yeah, I also, um, I don't know, do I have time to, to say something to that as well? It, it's almost everything said, but um, I just wanted to add, of course, these solo activities I was talking about, they are, that not everybody can afford them. So it's very clear uh, that uh, it's a very limited number of people who have the ability to shape what the future no normalities uh, should look, is looking like or should look like. So um, this is a very interesting uh, comment and we certainly have to keep that in mind. Okay, and before I end up talking too much, there's more, there's a question in the chat and Joy Hendry is raising her hand as well. Joy, I think you were first. Uh, hi, yeah, I was, think I was first. Um, actually, the other questions have been re running around what I was going to say, which I was partly to offer, but also to all of you. It was a great session. Thank you very much. Um, the words that you've been using in English, uh, two of them that bothered me, are <coughs> traditional and uh, normal, because um, what it, which, I mean, first of all, I'd like to know which Japanese words you're referring to, but <clears throat> the thing is that if you go out of your urban environments where you've been doing your research, you'll find that uh, things uh, are still quite different. And for example, in the country, it's quite common for men to look after children if they're the weakest person in a, <clears throat> a large family. So um, if uh, a, a grandfather is not very good at working on the land anymore, he might be given the task of looking after children. You know, he might do it as an automatic thing because he would be the one at home and the children will be small. But in the time I've worked in the country, uh, there's been quite a strong move from the granny looking after the children to the young wife saying, I want to be the one to look after the children. So there's a generation of people who passed on their children to their mothers-in-law when their children were small and never looked after children because then their daughters-in-law wanted to look after them themselves. I mean, that's the, from the woman's perspective and the woman doing the caring in the home. It's just that you're giving a totally nuclear family perspective, all of you, I think. And there are still parts of Japan, in fact, even in cities where the, the, there's, a, you know, there's a dual family, there's a senior and a junior family living above each other or um, in the country, they might not live together, but they live near enough by to take part. So I just wanted to raise that and ask you that the question was, when you say traditional, what do you mean? Um, and when you say normal, I realize that's a changing concept and you're talking about it, but what's the Japanese that you're using? <clears throat> so My you question. say that it was for me, so I, I never use traditional and normal. When I use normal, I just use futsu, I mean, 
so it's not my, it's the Futsu, and I think Nora's, it's the same at Nora's paper. So it's the Futsu, I'm a Futsu no Nihonji, and I'm Futsu, uh, futsu no Seikatsu. Okay, so not a Tari Mai. And, 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 but, but maybe more generally, and, and related to your question, as I said before, yes, we, I, 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 I don't know, admit that I'm, 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 I'm looking more, I'm looking at middle class, while now I can do it in, through Zoom, it could be in many places, not only in Tokyo, it could be Osaka, Tokyo, and even Hiroshima, whatever, but still it's 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 middle class. And, and, but and then I want, why, what's this middle class thing offer? I mean, you know, isn't no, everyone in people, middle class? Isn't everyone define, educated? People who define themselves as middle class. I mean, I, I, I don't, so, but but I I I I still see the, the the I don't know the benefits of being an anthropologist, and I'm trying to when I write about it, I'm very clear about it. I, I don't think like uh, relating to other questions that I don't you know, and also what Annette said, I I would never suggest that this reversed couple again reversed couple is of course not my definition. It's an emic definition. They say that we are reversed couple or yaku or we. I'm not using gender roles never because, but they use it. So so again, I okay. use the emic and not the ethic. I, I always do that. But in a way, but what is important and in related to your question, I don't, I, I don't think that I can say that there is a change in the way that that this will be. And opposite, and I. By the way, I don't see it in the West. So let let's not forget that also in the West, women do more than men at home, although they may use more third people, other women may, mainly to you to do it than in Japan. But I, let's keep this always in mind. But in a way, what what I'm trying, for example, for, for uh, to to do in my recent work is to look if there are you know just you know signs of of new gender ideologies, new ideas. And, and what I see during, uh, as I said, I started this looking from this perspective to 2013. So it has been some while. So there is a way, some kind of new discourse that comes up. I don't think it's a revolutionary. I don't think there will be a revolu gender revolution, uh, but I think we might look at the gender, you know, some kind of changes in gender ideas and gender ideology, while always looking and seeing that there is still a lot of gender inequality. Uh, uh, and yeah, no, no, I mean, please don't be defensive, Ofra, because I loved no, your presentation. I think it's very and, and I thought, and I loved your comments about how you don't know what the statistics are because you're an anthropologist. No, as well. but, but it's not defensive. I think it's important also for other. I think it's an important point of view to, to, to look at what groups of people think, but also always to be very clear about who is the group and what are they doing and how, and, and not to say that I'm, I'm, so I'm not talking about a big change. But I don't, didn't like your middle class bit because why are the farmers not middle class? Yeah. And they're certainly educated. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There have been all other people. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, I'll be quiet oh, now. Please. Um, um, Brigitte, Steg uh, Brigitte Steger is now also. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much. Sorry, I, I have this uh, brown hand, but I realize it is not really visible. Um, I was wondering about uh, the researchers influence in when you talk to people, uh, when they say I'm not uh, normal or because you're uh, obviously foreigners. And I, I have the feeling when people talk to me that they are very proud of not being normal and kind of traditional and kind of old uh, fashioned and so on. So that to show that they're actually more international and more modern. And this is uh, maybe they think, well, many people are like this, but that this is a kind of a statement of how you are different and so on. So that was one thing. I think I'll leave the other question. Uh, thinking that time is already over. Yeah. Okay, I'm muted. Should, should I answer that? Or can I uh, do a short answer? Okay, Brigitte, that's a wonderful comment. And of course, um, uh, this is something I thought about a lot. I couldn't uh, touch upon uh, that today. But obviously, um, it had a huge influence uh, that I am asking the questions. And um, uh, at one point, I realized it also it made a big difference if how I introduced myself. Mm -hmm. So at the point um, when I did these interviews, I had, I think, one child and I was married. 
And then when I said I'm a married woman and woman and I have a child, um, but I'm working full time and my husband is uh, working part time, whatever, I would get totally different answers than when I uh, came there, supposedly as a single woman, because usually people would think that I'm a single woman. Later on, I had two kids and there was again another uh, reactions. So uh, absolutely, I should have touched upon that in the paper. I addressed it uh, at a different uh, place, but yes, it makes a big difference. Being foreign, being female, having or not having kids, um, being married, not being married, and so on. Yes. Um, we had one more question in the chat. Um, maybe if we just read it very shortly. I wonder if you could develop a little bit about the gap between work gender policies and people's realities. Thank you. From Minerva Terrades. Yeah, maybe I should take that question because I was touching on the gender uh, policies. Uh, of course, I mean, what I um, also already mentioned is that the gender equality policies, work-life balance policies since the 1990s have been very much oriented towards the Western Europe, Northern Europe countries, Scandinavian countries, which are very couple oriented, as I said before. And uh, I think the reality in Japan is not so couple oriented. It's more than, I mean, also to joy, um, more than 70% of single never married people in the age between 18 and 34 are still living with their parents. Yeah, still living with their parents or dependent from their parents. And they also, I mean, I couldn't touch on that, but they told me, or it was also clear from that uh, fertility survey that many of the never married people who are actually working full time said, I am uh, sacrificing, I have to sacrifice my private life to work. So it's not only an issue of couples or people in living in couple formations, it's also an issue for people who are living alone or are being single. So they need someone at home. And I think the labor market is a huge problem that people are not able to lead several options of lives they actually want to lead. And the problem in Japan is that the, the private sector is huge public sector jobs are very few. For example, when you take a look at the Netherlands, there the public sector for women is huge. So 90% uh, of Netherlands women are working in the public sector part-time. So that's a total different picture there. And uh, Japan cannot turn the, 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 the employment sector into public sector employment. They cannot do that. So they really have to seriously think about what about the private sector employment. And they try to find these, what I talk, what, what I was talking about, the limited full-time employment jobs, but there's also heavy criticism towards that. So there still will be gaps between what people, this jisai ni narisona, so what is will likely become their realities and what they actually are wishing for. I, I don't know whether uh, that goes to uh, the tech support. Do we still have the possibility to discuss longer? Is the meeting room still open for a while? Um, yeah, you can continue for a while, but I will have to leave because I'm in tech support for another meeting. So I can just make you the um, host of a meeting and then it should remain open even if I leave. So maybe we can do just for a few minutes, we can proceed on that uh, so that we don't have to cut off. Thank you very much. Yeah, Nadine. that would be fine. Nadine, thank you very much. You're welcome, have fun. Okay, because I would also like to pose a question to both Ekaterina and Ofra, because I came across in my research on a debate that is called the Kajihara debate. Mm. And the, have you heard about that? That women are very strongly defending their uh, housework position and they do not want to have interference from their husbands. And what do you think about that? Why is that so strong in Japan? Katrina, do you, do you want to say something? Uh, I can say also. Um, yeah. So more, more recently, 
having children, I mostly do statistical analysis. I'm just so envious of all your brilliant work interviewing people and so on. Um, so I see, I mean, it would be interesting, again, getting inspiration from all your talks. I think with the surveys I work with, it's possible, for example, to identify uh, various, like, offers as a reverse gender couples and so on. In terms of uh, specifically powerful women, I do hear that uh, qu quite often from men actually. And I think whether it's the personality as well. I'm a foreign you know, woman, Woman, I'm married, I got kids, whether men feel they have to justify to me why they're not really helping at home. And I'm a woman working on uh, gender inequality in domestic work as well. I heard that it was mostly from elite men who say, well, I really try, but she never lets me. <laughs> I haven't heard that as much from women, I would, I would say, but I haven't been working doing interviews specifically. It's more just chatting with colleagues during my presentations or short visits to Japan, last of which was two years ago. <laughs> um, yeah. So the Kachihara is basically it's it's again it's it's commercial so it's I so I because it it was it's it's a, it's a housing company that did it so it, it's it's very interesting I really intend to go deeper into it I kept it very but I I I have a feeling that it has it it is commercial and it's kind of reproducing the role of women but on the other end I I would say that there are that. Some women, I mean, the, the idea of, of being a shufu in Japan, and this is strong in, in, in the idea of, of men can be, can, in a way, for men, it's, it's hard to become a house husband. It's not easy at all, not in Japan and not, other, and not in other parts of the world. But in a way, clinging to the shufu idea, to the idea that you are the manager of the house, and, and the idea that there is more prestige to it in Japan than in other places, in Western countries, is also uh, strong for women who don't want to kind of discard of their position as the manager of the house. So, but I, I guess I, I would agree with 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 Katrina that it comes more for men and not for women. But it's it's something to go more into. I think the Kajihara idea. Yes, I I still <laughs> intend to do so. I would just add actually uh, following Ofra's comments that. It also would be interesting to hear whether, I mean, uh, whether it's all the women who are more likely, if, if they, they indeed sort of subscribe to that idea, whether it's more all the women who have fewer choices, especially women who are married now, had kids potentially quit their jobs and really have now few options. And therefore, this is one way of self-realization for them uh, among the fairly limited repertoire uh, and compare that with the younger women who haven't yet potentially constrained themselves to, to, to such an extent. Mm. <clears throat> because uh, the family sociologist um, Tsutsui Junya, he said that in his view, the high expectations of a uh, household uh, uh, the, house, the quality of the household in Japan is so extremely high that, and women are being expected to hold to these expectations that they cannot just uh, let it go, you know, <laughs> they just cannot let it go to their husbands. And if it's a little bit not uh, a, a little bit messy around, so they, they just cannot accept that. that. That this seems to be a big hurdle for uh, realizing uh, negotiations between couples and that that the women are really in 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 the they are the gatekeepers mm. so to say, uh, when it comes to household affairs so i found that very interesting mm. but I wonder also to which extent that could be related to um, multi-generational households. This is a sort of shameless plug of the paper I published recently, but um, look, it purely looks at time use patterns. But as we know, in Japan, the co-residence with elderly parents have been going down. And therefore, in some ways, how much it's the ideal of a husband? When we say women are held to a high standard, they cannot do housework to a lower standard. It, who holds them up? Is it themselves? Is it completely internalized? Is it their husbands? Or is it maybe the older generation as well? And there are some maybe small indications. I didn't focus on that um, topic as much. I was just wondering uh, whether if you co-reside with the elderly uh, for women, for Japanese women and for men, it means lower domestic burden or higher domestic burden. 
burden because you could it could go both ways. Maybe they do more care responsibilities or just are held to these higher standards, or maybe actually the grandma mostly perhaps takes over. And it's it's in more recent years it, it's a bit ambiguous, and we see more support from um, grandparents as long as they're healthy. And then obviously if they're not healthy, it's um, they eat a lot of time from more from wives than from husbands mm -hmm. um, but and we also see I think the grandfathers some grandfathers contributions as well that sort of is a nod also to Joy's question earlier but I think there's a lot to unpack this is really an interesting question you're raising Annette and there's a lot to unpack as what's going on and who is holding whom to which standard and who is a barrier to change to some extent if if if, if you know we're looking for change. I can tell like a small story about it. Like in one of the couples, he left his, his work because he just wanted to live. It was okay. And his wife actually managed to get him into the Father in Japan Association and had him a trip to, uh, and anyway, but they were living, the only couple actually that were living with, with his mother and his mother couldn't stand it. He, she could, and she said, and the wife said, I mean, I interviewed both of them a few times and, and the wife said that she cannot, he cannot, Manage things. He needs to do to prepare dinner because she is the only breadwinner. But but his mother doesn't let him do that. He, she's always complaining because and she couldn't even get the idea that he took a childcare leave. I mean, she was really uh, devastated by that. So in a way, she was keeping him from trying to be a new man uh, because they were living together. This was a very interesting case of of, of another. Of, the, the former generation kind of keeping an eye of, of and she she was not so uh, 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 she was not blaming the do the daughter in law so much as she was blaming her son which was really interesting mm. so it was really yeah, I mean so it's an interesting case yeah 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 I think um, that also that also applies for workplaces where the middle aged uh, managers are very okay. much against taking men leaves parental leaves because they think that taking a leave is taking a holiday <laughs> uh, yeah yeah so Nora uh, would you like to wrap up a little bit or just <laughs> okay final comment yeah, like totally over time so um uh, i would just say thank you very much it was a wonderful panel um i got a lot of ideas and many topics um, i would love to touch upon more uh, more um, but uh, since it's already six, uh, seven o'clock in Japan, so maybe twelve <laughs> o'clock at your place. Yeah. Well, um, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I think. Okay, then uh, I also would like to again a, a thank, big thank you to you all that you have um, so matched so well in with the with the overall topic of the the panel. Thank you very much for, to the floor for your interesting comments and questions. I hope that we can meet in the digital place of Wonder Me and um, get along while having a cup of tea or something like that, while chatting to each other. So um, good luck for the rest of the conference and goodbye. And thank you for your for and Thanks everybody. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye You're bye. welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.